Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker Matthew Christensen. After a few years of pimping production knives, Matthew got on the maker's map with his Sinbad collaboration folder with Alpha Hunter Tactical, a knife that welled up in me an aching desire that could only be assuaged by lack of funds and time. Fast forward a few years later, and Matthew has a thriving custom knife making business in which his design and use of materials always strikes me as perfectly balanced and always beautiful. He has also been successful getting his custom designs in a wider cross section of hands with his multivariant thug and critical models being produced by We Civivi and Kaiser respectively. And now his latest release, the Maverick S, is a blockbuster and has the knife world all abuzz. It's always a pleasure talking with Matthew, and I look forward to catching up with him. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download uh, so you can download the show every time a new one is uploaded. Uh, Also, download the show to your favorite podcast app and listen. Listen while you do other stuff that you got to do. And uh, if you like the show and you think it's worth supporting with your fundage, uh, go check us out on Patreon. Uh, You can get exclusive content, including interview extras. Like, for instance, you'll hear more from Matthew uh, and knife giveaways, et cetera, et cetera. The quickest way to do that is to zap the QR code or to head to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Matthew, welcome to the show. It's good to have you back, sir. How's it going? Thanks for having me. Oh, it's going great. Uh, Well, congratulations on the raging success of the Maverick S. I just wanted to say that right up front. Thank you. Um, It was something that I wanted to do for a while, and I'm glad it did. It's doing as well as it's doing. So, thank you for that. Appreciate. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, wait. Well, tell us a little bit about that, and then and then we'll dig in. But the the Maverick is. A model of yours we were just talking about a custom model um how did you bring it to this wider market um it's always been a um like i love sheep foot as, as you know through like the kaiser critical and whatnot and you know warring cliffs um but the maverick is a newer model so i wanted to use a newer model that isn't out there a lot but the model just blew up when i first made it the maverick um i've had people change their orders to the maverick i've had people um you know want two or three of them at a time so it's you know i was like well i want to stop making my models into productions so that's what came about doing the smaller version of the Maverick for a production run. So I could keep that, um, you know, the custom version for the customs and then a smaller version for production. Um, I, it just blew up. So, you know, I was like, you know what, I'll do it that way to make it, make all the custom guys happy as well as, you know, the, you know, the part, the guys that want more production stuff. So, yeah. What well, what is it about <clears throat> excuse me what is it about that knife in particular that you think uh made it catch fire like that honestly i i personally don't know why people liked it so much i think it's more of a a simpler design um it is kind of based off one of my other models my uh my misfit so it's very it's not similar to it but it's the handle shape is simple, and I think it's just the simpl- simplicity and the EDC ver- EDC, you know, um, friendliness of it. 
I think people are really like like you digging the Warren Cliffs and digging the sheep's foot. I see, uh, I see the the Warren Cliff um, craze, if for lack of a better term. Uh, there was a few years there where Warren. Cl now I see sheep's foot even kind of eclipsing Warren Cliffs in popularity, and I I feel like that Maverick S or the the Maverick shaped blade is kind of exactly what people who are looking for EDC shapes are, are really going for because of all of the utility um, utility kind of built into it. And not for nothing, it's also a like incredibly handsome knife. Yeah, def uh, definitely. I mean, it's just something about the shape of it makes it simple, mm -hmm. simple handle. Blade shape is very useful and, you know, you could just use it for everything. And that's what, you know, I like about uh, Warnies and Sheepfoot. Um, I'm not someone that uses a real tactical style knife. I'm a user to open my packages every day, and it's just perfect for it. Now, you do have uh, a number of designs that are, uh, you know, a bit more tactical. Certainly, um, uh, the Thug, which is a, is a small knife, but it's with, uh, that is a, a a former custom, right? That is now being made by we and Civivi. That is another thing. I only did two of those. Oh, okay. So it's another model I wanted to not make into a custom um, and just bring it into the production. Um, it's very similar to a lot of my older stuff, like my uh, my Brute and uh, my mm. Dreadnought. Um, the blade shape's very close to a Dreadnought. And then, you know, just the size-wise... It's kind of uh, three models in one. Uh, if you if you get the dreadnought, the um, the brute, and I believe it's uh, my newer model, the misfit, they're kind of all mashed into one knife. So, in the you yeah. mean in the thug, the thug, yeah, is in the thug. Okay. That's what I mean, yeah. Okay, so you sent me a prototype of the thug before we produced it. We produced it first, and now Civivi has it, yes. which yes, is very correct. exciting. Because I got to be perfectly honest, we knives, we knife is awesome, no doubt. But they Civivi, are. Civivi is, dare I say, awesomer. <laughs> I I I love Civivi knives. I like them kind of even more than we knives, and uh, that's not to take anything away from we. But it's exciting to see the thug in the Civivi lineup as well. Yeah, of course. Um, it wasn't supposed to go that way right away, but I figured it, the the hype of the you know the thug, everyone's oh, it's a little thick, a little heavy. Um, that's what I was going for. I was going for a overbuilt, like I used to make when I was um, first beginning. Something that was thick, overbuilt, not gonna hurt it. Um, but all the feedback I got of we want something thinner, lighter, um, a little cheaper. Um, so yeah, so we went that route as well with the with the CVV Thug, with the four different options. So, well, if you're a micarta addict such as myself, that's kind of the way that you can get the Thug blade and the well the Thug model yes. in in your in your micartas. Yeah, um, CVV has the. Uh, the, I think two, yeah, black and green, I believe. So, okay, so this is obviously a licensed design, a design that you licensed to the Wee Knife Company and and they to Civivi and all that. But the Maverick S, that is under the uh, CK lineup. That is a Christensen Knife Works. Yeah, wow. and it was uh, produced by Riot. Yeah. Okay. It's uh, um, the Thug and the Critical and all those have been under the line of we and kaiser and it's in their lineup um the maverick is um like uh the oem i have them do it and then i sell them all so nice. limited runs um when they go through yep so you have knives being produced you have designs being produced <clears throat> by the top three well arguably the top three oems in um you know, in China, uh, I would also throw Best Tech in there. But you got you got We, Kaiser, and Riot. I know that some are licensed and some are OEM. But of course, how how is that uh, experience? Is is it 
Is it similar working with all those companies? Um, yes and no. Uh, they're all pretty hard to get a hold of. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, um, you know, there's that, you know, the, uh, the language barrier here and there, but also the timeline, the, um, um, the, the zones. It's just so hard to talk to someone at a decent time. So um, you're looking at, going to um talk to someone and it's 3 a.m until they email you back and by the time you mm -hmm. email them back it's another two days before they get back to you so in that realm of yeah it's a little tough talking to them getting things all you know um figured out same but every all three companies are totally different on how they work and how they um how they do things um, won't say one's worse than the other. It's just, you know, you're working with three different companies in the, in the long run. So, um, but all in all, can't complain. Um, they're pretty straightforward. They know what they're doing. They know how to do their computer work. They know how to, you know, um, I send them 2d drawings and they have a 3d drawing or rendering done in a week. Pretty you know, pretty simple. And within a couple months, I have prototypes on the way. So, wow. yeah, they, they know what they're doing when it comes to that. I mean, that's all they do all day long. So, but um, yeah, no complaints, really. Um, just the normal wait times and stuff right. can, uh, can put a damp around things. Well, it, it is really the new paradigm for, for knife makers, whether you're a designer, uh, someone who's, you know, designing knives or making knives such as yourself. I mean, we're kind of reliant on these companies at this point. Uh, and by these companies, I mean the big, the big awesome OEMs uh, over in China. I got to say, we're kind of relying on them because we're, we are getting this constant feed of mm -hmm. amazingly produced knives by our favorite makers and designers. Uh, Matthew, uh, your work is not, um, you know, it's not easy to come by and it's not inexpensive, <laughs> but if someone loves your work, they can still get it. They can still get their hands on it. And to me, that's the beauty of the way things are right now. Of course. Yeah. That's what, I mean, that's what I was going for. I've never, when I first started making customs and really getting popular per se, mm -hmm. um, I always said I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't, you know, sell out, but thinking about how, like you said, getting the knives into people's hands. I'm backed up. I have a lot going on. I have a show coming up. I'm, you know, in the shop all day and you can only make so many knives a week. So if someone really wants one of my designs, not per se, just a custom, they could have that and beat it up or, you know, just get the feel of, you know, uh, the shape of the handle or, or whatnot. That's what I was really going for. And also getting them in hands of people that really aren't knife people, or you just won't spend the money on the customs because they think, Oh, it's $10. I could buy that somewhere else. Like all my friends, I always make fun of them and say, Hey, here's a, here's a production. And now you don't stop asking me to give you discounts kind of thing. So, <laughs> yeah. You know, but, but, um, but yeah, that was the thing. Like I, a lot of times I, I give them away. I've given, I think I gave over 30 of the Mavericks away to friends and just good friends, uh, good like customers. And, you know, with this, um, every time a Kaiser, new Kaiser comes out, uh, critical, I always buy five or six, give them to friends or, you know, uh, auction them or not auction uh raffle them on uh my group and facebook group and whatnot so giveaways and stuff so yeah that's I, I just love doing that and it's easier to do that than giving away you know three days of work if that makes sense yeah yeah, yeah. well it it does and what a <laughs> yeah what a great way to <laughs> to be able to you know give gifts without like you said going to great lengths yeah, you, you don't want to give one of these things away for free because they take so much time and effort. No, they definitely do. I mean, I have, I've donated 
I donate usually two or three a year. Um, good causes, friends, whatnot, if I, I need to. Mostly um, raffles on my group page. Um, but, I mean, it depends on the time of year and, you know, health-wise and how I'm doing on orders and shows coming up, that kind of thing. So, Well, for people who may not have heard the the other time you were on the show, what – how did you get started? I mentioned up front that you used to um, uh, enhance. I know, I know, I know. People bristle at the term knife pimping now, but uh, yeah. you used to enhance people's production knives. Tell me about that. Yeah, you know what i I started just dabbling with my own stuff and customizing them, and uh, YouTube was starting to be a thing then um, with uh, Jeff um, mm -hmm. Tough Knives. And, you know, there's Mike Gavick, Gavco, and all those guys were, uh, you know, just starting making. And I wasn't to the level of, I didn't have the room. I had a full-time job, and it was just a hobby. So I was just messing around in the shop uh, or in the garage and um, just started customizing. And I would, I wouldn't say I'm the one of the first generations. I would second gen of knife customizing because when you come to like usn stuff um there's guys in there that were customizing emerson's and whatnot mm -hmm. way prior than me but you know the youtube and instagram generation of you know modifying you know the spider codes and all the production stuff was was definitely good for me and where i learned techniques that i know now that if i didn't do that i would probably be you know i probably wouldn't be where i'm at but it's hard to say because i have a lot of knife friends that started off just straight making folders and they're make they're doing some incredible work so but yeah that was definitely the you know the starting point where customizing and you know getting to learn that with most minimal tools you know one by 30 and a dremel tool you know pretty much all it was and uh going back seeing that stuff i don't know if it's the best but it's <laughs> it's definitely my roots so yeah it it reminds me what you know the whole concept of starting off an, an amazing career in knife making such as yours i mean you're producing such beautiful work and you have an accomplished um, catalog of designs. And to think of you starting um, by knife customizing, production knife customizing, reminds mm -hmm. me of like the um, Renaissance artists who would, you know, dig up corpses and kind of, you know, look through them to know what human anatomy was like. So, yeah, they, could, th so they could draw it properly. Well, I would imagine dissecting so many production knives over that period of time when you were pimping these knives, you've, you probably got a real understanding of the of the inner workings of these things. Uh, did that help uh, when you set out to start making? Of course. Um, a lot of it was, yeah, just figuring out how they worked. I, I started off doing, before I really, I didn't really make fixed blades at all. So it was taking apart the knives, making sure they worked why is this doing this because i replaced this but why is he doing that now detent slop lock stick that kind of thing um you learn that before you start learning how to even set that stuff and then i started making friction folders and that taught me a lot of geometry of open closed you know handle to blade ratio um just how they work together and you know how how they fit in and make it you know a somewhat good looking knife but yeah definitely uh, modifying knives and forms the usn and really mm -hmm. helped me when i first started and then i worked for david curtis for a little bit when i first started um sinbad was the first folder i made that was a decent knife decent folder i could say i only made like three other like locking knives prior to that and it, yeah i don't even want to talk about that so um but working with uh curtis and he he helped me a lot with um 
just how setting stuff and you know just hands-on it's a lot of hands-on learning and messing up and changing things and you know i shouldn't do that i'll change that next time you know kind of thing so um tell all these new makers or these kids that want to start you have to be hands-on don't be scared to ruin some stuff because mm -hmm. it's gonna happen you have to i could show you or tell you how to do it but there's these little things that you learn just by messing up or doing something a little different and you're like oh that's how that works or oh don't do that again I, don't yeah and you're gonna mess it up even more if you keep going so you just get a lot of hands on and just going with the flow so and who knows your particular insufficiency or your particular laziness might actually lead to an innovation you know uh oh, of man. course yeah. you know what i mean um the knife you sent me about a year ago maybe two years ago geez i don't know time flies but you was sent me in thug? uh what's that was it the thug no, it wasn't. Oh, yeah. You sent me the thug to check out, but you sent me a full custom to check out before it went to the customer. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, and I'm trying to remember. It was a beautiful drop point blade with sort of a teardrop shaped handle ish. And it had an orange peel. And the the reason I'm bringing this up, I mean, it was it was exquisite. It was an awesome knife. I love the design of that knife. I love that most of your designs. Um like a whole lot they appeal to me but the reason i'm bringing that knife up is i was shocked at how how really perfectly tuned the lock bar uh the lock and the interface between the lock and the blade tang seemed to be there was no as i recall no lock bar insert um in there uh and it was yeah, it was it was perfect and there was no stick and there was no wobble and there was no play and yet it felt like there should be because it's so smoothly locked up and unlocked. Is that from working with an older guy like Dave Curtis or? Um, actually, no, that is more of just learning what works. Um, over the, it's all about trial and error on different knives. If it's a bigger knife, you want a longer lock bar. You, normally, that's what, usually what happens, longer lock bar. Then you want a thicker relief and um, different angles, just going through the models of what I did. And a lot of my knives are based off of only two geometries, really. Hmm. If you look at most of them, they're all the same. Around the lock, pivot, and, you know, open, closed. And then they just kind of build off of that so everything is i've fine-tuned you know that the mechanics of it um once i made it work i know every knife in like uh, lock relief cut i have it written down um mm. it could be a thousandth and it'll change the whole you know feel of the knife you have lock stick it'll have um you know um, too much detent or like liner locks are very tricky if it's a long liner lock, if it's if it's bent wrong, because you got to kind of curve the whole thing, the detents all messed up, and the lock jam or the lock face, it's it's hard to explain, but it's just working at it and just knowing what you're doing. Now it's just you know muscle memory and just how mm -hmm. I do it, and um, talking to other makers and going back and forth. Hey, what does this this work for you? no i don't like this bar anymore i don't like how to do this i used to do radius locks and on my older stuff and went to flat locks well what angle should i use here well the lock bar is two inches you should use this angle and it's it's a lot more than people think and i mean it just, like i said it's just muscle memory and all my models are based off of a certain you know they're all kind of you know, here, I got a, if you think, so if you look at, like, the pivot area here, and then you look at the pivot area on this new production that I'm doing, oh, Ooh. they're almost the same. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, bring they're them very, down. They're very, oh, yeah. I'm all, there we they're go. Almost, they're almost the same when it comes to 
like the pin and the lock bar and everything is the same geometry with all of it. And once you get that right, you just know everything is that angle needs to be cleaned up like that. Or, you know, detent goes in the same spot in every single knife. So it's, it's just, you know, learning from trial and error and just getting it right. So, I mean, every, every maker does it different and, if you do it long enough, you figure it out. So right, right. it's a, uh, it's, it's a science, but it's not, if that makes sense. Cause if you look at like, um, Chris Reeves and stuff, their locks are totally different than what, you know, something I would do would do it early and no lock stick or, you know, striders usually have a lock stick, but people like that, but some of them don't. Emerson's are different. They're a more of a, you know, lighter lock, but it's mid lock and it's every maker is different. It's yeah. just, it's a wide range of how things work and not one is better than the other and not one is, you know, right or wrong. So it's whatever works, whatever doesn't give lock stick, um, uh, slip or, you know, it's not, too far over that you know it's not safe so just getting down to it and just figuring out what works for that model pretty much so well that that seems to make sense you know to come up with uh with a solution for the most complicated part right the pivot and the, lo and the lockup and then build everything around it that man that uh, well, just coming up with a system for anything creative that you have to reproduce over and over again is absolutely essential. I don't care what you're what you're making, but you have to figure out a way to 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 make it the same and to make production of it smooth. I'm thinking right now of what I do, but but it's it it's the same thing, and so it makes sense for me uh, that that you would do it that way. And then you have the freedom to design all the stuff around it. In a, in of a course, way. yeah. That I mean, that's what makes it it's essential. You can't have a different lock and a different, you know, stop and, you know, close location different on every knife, unless you're only doing two or three. I have, I think 12 models that I do consistently and they all have a smaller version of that model. Mm -hmm. So, you know, 24 different models. And if I, they were all different, I would lose my mind. I, <laughs> I would I would have lock stick here and there and, you know, but just getting it dialed down to what works for all of them is, you know, I only have, I think only three geometries that I use and I kind of fit, I change, I'll change the open and close um, on the blade, but the lock pin or the, the pin and the lock bar are in the same location every time. So, yeah. Well, okay, so I uh, this makes me wonder, you know, you hand your designs over um, now. These days, you hand your designs over to uh, production companies who who you trust to to make them, um, and they will. They, I'm sure, they will change things for their production. Uh, of course, for, yeah. for e for ease of of production, um, but. Uh, when when you're doing that, how much license do they get to make these changes? Is it is it just to you know? Because I'm thinking about the lock. You spent all this time in getting that lock and that whole pivot area dialed in, and then you send it to them. Do they change they, it up for their own purposes? They or? do. They'll they'll change it a little bit. It's nothing like drastic out of you know of what I've done. Um, they clean it up and make it work for their machines. Um, since everything I do is I water jet parts and then everything's by hand from there. Them, it's all machines. So they got to make it work for them. A lot of the times it is pretty similar to what I do. They send, you know, the drawings and everything to make sure it's right. And I, I give them free reign. If, make it work, but make it work right. And I'm all right with it. So a lot of it is um, when it comes to a lot of mine, like, you know, people love action, a good action on a knife. And it, it has to have a good action because that's what action lockup. Obviously, it's people like to fidget with stuff. And if it doesn't have it, then 
you know, back to the drawing board, change this, change that. Um, with the Mavericks, I had to do that a little bit. I had to have them change the lock detent or the detent a little stronger um, and move one little thing. And, you know, it's pretty close to my drawings, but they have to make it work for them. So I give them as much, you know, um, leeway as they possibly need. Um, so I'm not picky with that. Right, right. Well, I um, I commented to you on how much I love your tyrant model. Yeah. Uh, which is just, it's so cool to me. It's like a perfect uh, profile. The profile of it is, mm. and, uh, and I said to you, this seems like the kind you could dress up or dress down. And you sent me three pictures, one <laughs> ultra, ultra dressy with, with a, with mocha tie handle, I guess, or I don't even know what the handle was. It was crazy. Yeah, dark tie, nickels, dark tie. Yeah. And then a gorgeous, uh, uh, Damascus. And then, and then a mid grade, it looked like it had a, a, it had a black blade and some speed holes and some treatment. Yeah. And then a plain Jane showing that, yeah, that design, uh, looks beautiful in all three of those kind of, um, states of dress or presentation as a maker. What, what's your favorite kind of style to work on my i personally love the simple edc style micarta low grit you know low grit satin blade um just because that's that's what i would carry i'm uh mm -hmm. i'm simple i like you could beat it up and easy to fix or easy to clean up when you need it to be um, don't get me wrong. The full dress stuff is blows my mind every time I color it or uh, grind a blade. Like I finished a, a custom Maverick today, and the blade came out amazing. Like perfectly centered. It was sand my. It was just blew blew me away how nice it was. And would I carry that? No. But it had, you know some fancy bits on it and then it had carbon fiber so it was like you know a good mix of both worlds and you know i would personally love a you know high satin blade with some micarta and zerk accents that's like my favorite so um they're easier to do too so i can get them done faster right less, right less work less work and the stakes but, uh, are lower right you mess up a micarta handle of course yeah not not as big a deal it's five bucks. So mess up dark tie handle. It's 300 bucks. So oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. That's just one side. So, you know, that yeah, I could, I could have a thousand dollars in materials just in the handle on a full dress knife. So yeah, it could, uh, it could get pricey for sure. So everything you, you water jet your parts and then everything else is done by hand. Is that, uh, is that something, is that a way you want to continue, um, that is a very art artisanal way of making a knife, I think, because your hands are all over it. And, and you know, there's so much handwork. Um, and that's part of what makes your knives appealing, I would imagine. Um, is this how you intend to continue? Um, for now, yes. I don't have any plans to go full like CNC or anything like that anytime soon. Um, it's a little more work how I do it, but I mean, that's just, I, that's just what I like. So I know I'm, I'm nothing against CNC guys, which I wish I knew how to even run one of them oh, because yeah. doing inlays, I love inlays and doing stuff like that, but it's, it's tough for me to do them now. And it just takes so much longer and um, down the road, maybe have a machine and do half and half. Um, my buddy uh, Jim over at HMC Knives, he's doing a uh, production slash mid tech for me now. Um, he calls them the Max um, Machine Assisted Customs. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So uh, um, Ian at CMF, Brian Efros, a um, couple other guys are doing it as well. Brian Brown. Um, Jim's a custom maker, did. Same as like me, did uh, he did he worked at a different shop, he did a lot of machine work at a shop and water jet parts and custom made it. Well, now he works full time doing knife stuff, so he's 
dabbling into doing like mid tech runs, you know, 20, 30 a year, 40 a year for custom makers. So, um, what's, his, what's his name? HMC Knives. Jim oh, 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 yeah. 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 H- yeah. Uh, well, I follow them. I don't know. I don't know him, but I follow him on Instagram. Um, but, uh, it's relatable that's what i was trying to get at of course but knowing knowing that your hands that you're building it with your hands is a is a is i would imagine part of part of the experience of buying your knives and it's nice knowing not that if you did it all on cnc we'd love them too but it's somehow it's nice knowing that each one uh got that sort of attention from your hands and to me um that translates into customer service I know that that's important to you. Um, how how do you? Uh, what's your philosophy on customer service, and how does that carry over into the stuff other people are making on your behalf? Um, I really don't understand the question. Like the- <laughs> that's because I made it overly yeah. complicated. Uh, well, the customer service is easy for your custom knives. If someone has a problem, they send it back. Someone wants a spa treatment, they send it back. But yep. I get a wee thug, and I'm like, "There's a problem with my wee thug, Matthew Christensen. What's up with this? How, what's yeah? <laughs> okay, contact we. Yeah, but I mean, you feel it. You feel bad. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure, like, had people complain about the clip on the thug. It's a little sharp. Like I feel it. Like oh man, I. I why did they do it like that? The prototypes didn't have it like that. Um, it came out and they're, you know, that's the one thing no one likes and that's why no one's buying them. Cause the, so it's like you, you feel for the customer that one little thing that they don't like or that's wrong with it or the lock slips. I mean, it's really not in my hands. Of mm-hmm. course, I'd love to fix it, but I just can't. I just can't. If, if that was the case, I'd would have i wouldn't be able to do anything i'd just be fixing knives all day same with these um these mavericks i had uh some people the liner lock version has no insert so lock insert and they set the lock super early and it has a weird like if you could hear it here i'll open one it has a pop to it Mm mm-hmm in the lock, it's probably can't hear it, but I don't like that. I checked, I mean, I had over 600 of them, so I had to check every five or so. And some got some got out there. Well, since they made it, I don't know how they made it, I don't know how to fix it. Mm-hmm. I had to figure it out because I'm the one selling them. When it comes to we and you know, Kaiser, I'm not selling it, it's just my name on it. So obviously I feel for them, but their customer service is what would deal with that. Not me, but when it comes to the Mavericks, it's all me because, you know, it's, I sold it and I would have to figure it out. Now, when it comes to like warranty, warranty, something broke. Um, I do have extra parts, which, you know, that's a good thing, but yeah, it's just, it's hard to, balance at all that makes sense well yeah sure because i mean some of it you're like all the production stuff you're not responsible for but uh the stuff that you're selling under your own name uh the maverick s for instance yeah Mm -hmm. i can see how uh you're on the hook for that because you're selling it so that people might be sending something to you can you tweak this can you tweak that i can um, there's, I mean, in the website, there are some guidelines and, you know, warranty and whatnot. And it's three months after purchase. If, you know, something goes wrong. Um, I'm one of them people that are going to try to fix it if I can, even if it's down the road, you know, someone mess with it. If I could fix it, I'm going to try. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, that's just how I am. You know, some people know. Does it bite me in the butt? Yeah, all the time. So, I mean, I get it. With these Mavericks, I had, um, so this is a titanium version I did mm. with uh, dark tie accents. But when they made these, 
they made the studs weird and they were breaking when they were assembling them. Well, they made half of them with the ones that were put together and didn't break. And then they made the other half a different way in a way that I told them how to do it. Like um, Stephen Kelly, a tie connector makes them Oh, okay. Um, with a little stud in the middle and it works perfect. Well, five or six people got one and they flicked it open and it broke a stud. Well, I really can't fix that. It's broken. So getting parts from them to, you know, send out, how long will that go on for? Someone gets one in a year and it does that. Well, am I responsible for it? You know? So that's, that's what it, it's hard to juggle it. It's hard to, you know, figure that out. But knowing me, I'll make a custom stud for it because, you know, that's my name's on it. So it's like, but getting to that, you know, it bite me in the butt in the end. But it's, it's kind of hard to, uh, you know, say no to someone when it's, you know, your name on it. Yeah. Definitely. Well, so. and, and ultimately, I guess that's why you look for the best makers, you know, and that's why you have the best people making your knives, uh, making your designs, mm-hmm. uh, because you, you probably have very little of that stuff to deal with ever because of who's making these things. Of course. Yeah. I mean, there's always going to be something wrong. Custom production, cheap China fake stuff. I mean, when you, there's always going to be that one knife or that one thing that's going to be wrong or someone's not going to like, or, you know, it, you can't please everyone and nothing's perfect. Yeah. Um, customs, I try my best. I try my best to make it perfect. Is it? No. Um, always improve on the next knife. So these next run of Mavericks, I have some changes um, just to make it that much better. So you got to you got to improve with everything you do. And um, yeah, it's really, really all you can do. Uh, with the critical, uh, it initially came out with Kaiser as a, I believe it was two, two versions in titanium. One had the speed holes. One didn't, if I recall correctly. And they then both did. One was a flipper. Both. One was a non. Okay. Yeah. And then several years later, uh, they came back out with the critical in, in several other iterations smaller. Yes. How did that, how did that, uh, come about? How did the critical get its, uh, resurrection if you will um that was in the works for a long time um kaiser um likes to go through people they like to have new people come in and um not saying it's bad but uh sending it to like my design it was supposed to be made never got made it got lost then it had to be restarted and then they got busy and it just it just never never worked out to how to come out right when the, when the large one came out. So, oh, okay. um, had one, one of the guys get in there and say, Oh, we're going to get it started. And he jumped on it and, um, you know, got it rolling. So I was happy for that. And it was the plan to do it as like the, we and the Civivi. So this is their Vanguard. So they're, they're, you know, lower cost, you know, G10 center blades, <laughs> liner locks to make it um lighter smaller um better price point that kind of thing so uh, eventually the large will be coming out as this uh vanguard edition um when i'm not sure they have a lot on their plate right now so if it comes out it comes out i'm not gonna you know complain yeah i love their vanguard line uh kaiser's awesome and they're they're vanguard uh but i thought uh when when the mini criticals came out, I thought, wow, that's really smart. Like they waited a couple of years and brought out and, and kind of brought out this design again. It's such a good design. And a lot of, a lot of times uh, great designs come out to some fanfare and then they get lost in time because other designs pile on top and then, and then, no, oh, that's a design from three years ago, but still it's a great knife design. Yeah. And, and I thought it, it was, I thought it was cool. I thought, I thought that was strategic. In other words, having it come out later. Cause it. Um, I didn't want it to come out right when the large one came out. I wanted it, it was like a year later, but mm-hmm. it's been like three, I think, or two and a half. Um, it worked out. So I'm happy for that. Um, it wasn't 
plan for that long, but you know, I mean, you could think that I'll, I'll take back. <laughs> I'll, you'll take the credit. Yeah. Do you ever have to worry about, or have you uh, experienced thus far cloning of any of your work? Um, my, one of my very old models, um, the Brutus, um, it's a small little butcher rhino looking knife. I don't make it anymore. Um, but a couple companies cloned it like three different, four different companies. One was larger. Um, one was like super tiny little like inch blade didn't really take off so i didn't really i didn't really care i mean there's nothing you really can do um yeah. i'm happy it hasn't gone any farther with any other ones will it someday i hope not but if it does it does i mean you can't really you can't really help it so um yeah i, I gotta I kinda, say kind of shrug to that and be like uh, it sucks but what can you do I guess I guess the best way to look at it is imitation is the highest form of flattery. I guess that's the most generous way to to look at it. But I, I'm always shocked that there's a company called Effin Grow, and I think they're maybe they're the ones who did your Brutus. Yeah, it is. they just blatantly like, oh, here's a Strider for thirty bucks. Oh, here's a a, yep, a Microtech for thirty bucks. Yeah, you could find it on Ally and um, Alibaba pretty easily. You just put in like Rhino knife, and it pops up. Um, horribly done too, but mm. you know, like they put um, Serge Pachenko's logo on it. It's <laughs> like it's like not even his, oh my and God. yeah, it's like they put his SP on there, and whatever. What are you gonna do? You know, so, I mean, like you said, flattering, but. No, well, not really. No, that's insult to injury, man. They clone yeah. your knife and put someone else's <laughs> logo on it. Well, they do that. Like they did, um, like Dalibor and put Serge's logo on it too. And it's like, well, I mean, whatever. Who cares? Like, move on. You know, you don't, you don't lose sleep over it. You know, it's twenty bucks. How many people bought them? You know. Yeah. Um, I did have a. I did find a website that was putting their logo on it. And they sold like, I don't know, they had them for sale for like 30 bucks. But it was some random, like, I don't, I don't even, outdoors company. They're like, oh, we didn't know. And I was like, oh, it's fine. Just stop selling them. Yeah. You know? And then they got all butt hurt. And I was like, sell what you have and don't do it anymore. I'm yeah. not going to, you know, like tell you not. You can do what you want. Oh, you don't have a patent on it. I said, yeah, don't be that way, though. You know, just. Yeah. You know, you can if you want, but you ain't going to get far doing that. Not only but, that, but if you're going to be a scumbag and rip off someone's knife, or if, you, if you're if you just going to make a knife for mm -hmm. cheap, there are so, so many designs that would be much easier to produce than that knife in particular. You know, it's, got a, it's yeah. got a weird shape blade. And like, why well, not? They, just... did, they didn't know. The person that was selling them did had no clue. They just bought 30 of them or 40 oh, of them on, right, right, you right. know. And then just put their logo on it. So they're an American based company that was selling them. I and, you. I you know, like those, you ever see those EDC boxes you get in the mail, mm -hmm. like, you know, that kind of thing. Um, eh, whatever. I don't, didn't see them much. Just, you know, a couple months and then they're pretty much gone. Um, you know, but I'm not going to lose sleep over, like I said. So, but. What do you what do you think like okay this is going to sound like a like a high school guidance counselor question but I, I'm sitting here thinking we you and I have talked an, a couple of times and uh your attitude is very interesting to me because you're you're pretty chill you've got you've got this 12 knife catalog of in, incredible designs and you have experience making custom work and also dealing with oems what have you learned about business in general being in the knife business don't take orders <laughs> <laughs> um i could bite my tongue for that um it's very talking let's say i'm talking to a a new maker 
if you haven't taken orders, don't take them because it eventually just comes back and you just get overwhelmed. Um, I enjoy what I do, but it's a job now. Um, very stressful with shows and eventually I hope to slow down and very, you know, you know, get ahead of myself, but I think it's, sorry, I lost train of thought. What, what was your question again? <laughs> well, the, the question was, what have you learned? What about I learned business yeah, in general? Um, don't take orders. Just, I'm, I try my best not to, but it's like a, just a never ending, you know, rotation. Um, work in order it's very hard to say i'm still new to it i'm still figuring it out i'm still you know trying to get make it right or do it right and um you know i don't have any experience in sales i don't have experience on my own business i have no one that really is in what i do that i could talk to about business but what i've learned is you know just work your butt off and don't take orders. That's that's all I can think of. If if I went back eight years ago, I'd probably do things a lot different. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not. I don't regret where I'm at, but I think it would be less stressful if you know, knowing what I know now and how customers work and how you know, um getting things done in time timelines are bad i'm always way behind on timelines one thing goes wrong i gotta order a new blade that takes a week adds another week you know that's the one thing overestimate you know and then overestimate your timeline and you know make sure you get it done before that so it's 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 always a learning curve when it comes to that business wise you see People always say knife makers are horrible business businessmen because we're one person. We just work our butts off and we forget that aspect of it, of money. You know, at least I do. I forget mm-hmm. like all these people are my friends and you got to think of, no, not all of them are your friends, but you want them to be, you mm-hmm. know, that's how I think of it. I love going to shows for that reason because I just love love everyone in the knife community old new new friends old friends just um you know fixed blade guys edc guys production guys you know just that's my favorite thing about you know what i do so just know that it is a business and you know treat it like one um but yeah i wish i could go back and change some things but that's just you know go ahead you said don't take orders, and and uh, what I think you mean by that uh, is um, don't don't have big books exactly. full, full of custom orders that you have to oh, go, tick through. Okay, uh, not yeah, like I'm an, a year plus out mm. on what I have. Probably it could be almost two years if you know if if I miss a, a month. Like I was sick and I missed a whole month of work, and that's just. That's just think about it. That's 10 knives Jeez. that adds up quick. So well, what's, what's the alternative for a knife maker who's starting out? Um, because they want to sort of guarantee, I would imagine that they're going to have a certain customer base. So it seems like course. you got to do that up front, but, but are you saying more like make the knives and then release them to the world? Make them, and... sell them. Yeah. yeah. Make them, sell them shows. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of guys do that. And mm-hmm. It works out. It's perfect. But it, you start taking those orders and then that stress on top of more stress. And, yeah. you know, you mess one thing up, there goes even more stress. And then shows come up or, you know, that kind of thing. But, yeah, big order books is what I meant. Like, don't take 30, 40 orders. That's just, you know, a recipe for disaster. And I've learned from that, you know, so. Um, that's one thing I would like to stop doing is, or would have liked to stop doing years ago, um, would be not take orders or big order books, you know, to, you know, people like waiting, but some people are impatient and I get that. I am, Mm -hmm. Uh, I get, I'm surprised that people even have patience for me and I'm like, 
a week in, I'm like, hey, is my knife done? Hey, is my this done? I oh. and uh, these guys are waiting a year. You know, I'm always, you know, okay with you know them asking, and it's how it is. It's just, you know, something that I would definitely have changed when I started. But yeah, you, but you get you get excited. So all these people want like you have 30 people that want a knife from you. You're like, Oh yes. Yeah. I got to get you on the hook. Like, yes. I, yeah. Cause oh, you want one. I, I'll yeah. put you down. And I mean, I understand that, like that feeling of someone wants something that I make. That's, you know, that is a good push to work harder, but it wears you out. And that's well, the bad thing. Instagram is the age of Instagram. And, and I, I, I I'm sure other social media that i'm just too old to know about but uh instagram man it's perfect for that sort of uh, mode of knife making um where you make it and you drop it and you show it off and people buy it you know because you have this immediate uh release mechanism where you can show the stuff off um so maybe this is the best time ever to start off like that without the books or with with of course. A, a few orders and then and then move to the mode you're talking about yeah of course i mean it's instagram's big but i mean it's very you just gotta get your name out there you get that one guy to post it and your stuff could go crazy post it in facebook groups facebook groups are big i i always tell people to make a group page and um you get the people that want your stuff are in your group yeah. looking at your stuff you don't have to weed through those people that you know there's you have 900 comments or likes and there's only one guy that's going to buy that knife but if you have a facebook group you have dedicated people in that group and you know that are in every other group as well but they're like oh let's check out christian's stuff today and they scroll through that's for sale i'm gonna get in on it you know that kind of thing. Instagram is a lot of uh, a lot of fill. I guess you could mm. say there's a lot of. Um, I would say eighty percent of the people that even follow you are just follow you because they seen a picture. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, but when it comes to a Facebook group, a lot of them people are there because your knives and they want to buy them. Mm. Um, yeah, but, and that's the most focused place where they can come and actually find course. your work. Yeah, but Instagram is very good to get your name out there, um, and uh, YouTube is getting big again. I know there's a lot of people doing a lot of YouTube stuff, live videos. Mm-hmm. Um, I always tell some fr- like a couple friends that hey, you got to be like active. You got to be commenting. You got to respond to people. You have to. You know, customers like that. You're just one of them, and you make a good product, and they like what you do. They're gonna buy it. You know, eventually. That's how I always thought of it, and it's worked. I, I like I said, I love my customers, so I respond to everyone. I love when people post and make jokes or whatever, and I'm just a human that make knives. You know, so well. buy buy me a beer and let's talk, you know, that's, that's like my favorite thing is just let's hang out and talk knives and I'll make you something someday. That kind of thing. Well, you Matthew, know, so. tell, tell people how they buy you a beer and talk knives <laughs> with you so they can get one. Um, if you live close, we could hang out at the shop, but, um, otherwise, um, hit me up on Instagram, see knife works. Um, my Facebook group is, um, I believe Christensen knife works slash dogs slash c10s because i love my dog and trucks and yeah hit me up on instagram or in my group and we could talk so awesome well matthew oh, thank you i did yeah. want to show you a couple things oh please before we leave. what are you holding do, out on us for <laughs> i do have the new large thug coming out oh yes it will be coming out in full tie just the same three configurations as the small thug. Well, they're calling this the XL. And is that a three and a half inch blade? It is, yeah, it's just about three and a half. Yep. 
Oh man. So it's it's a bigger knife, so I love that. That's coming out um end of year, I believe, like fourth quarter ish, I I hope. Because the Civivi Thug is out, I believe the end of the month will be start distributing. So that one's exciting, and this is next. Uh-huh. So it'll be like tie with a acid or a blade, tie with a satin blade, and then uh another carbon fiber with an acid rub blade. So yeah, definitely, definitely someone, everyone, everyone wanted this one and I'm excited for this. Um, lightning holes and everything or lightning pockets. It's lighter than the small thug, which is, Oh, no way. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's a little, little back heavy, but all around it's only like an ounce and a half more weight. So it's, have being a big knife, it's it's wild to think that it's almost the same, same. Um, but I love yeah, it. I carry that every I, day. That's my. I that's my... I love that. Yeah, I love that that exists and that we'll soon be able to buy that. And it will be a Civivi one day. Awesome. So we're thinking beginning of next year. So same, same as uh, like this time next year will be a Civivi version. So that that'll be fun. Um. And then we have the Alliance. Nice. The Kraken. This is one of my older models that Alliance is doing for me, which they did the Bangarang back yeah. in the day. Yeah, that is beautiful, man. It is very, it's a very uh, Tonto Quaken style blade. Um, this once this hits the market will be discontinued for all customs so that gives a little bit more yeah. you know incentive to buy it but this will have like five different variations um some damascus some damasteel some fat carbon um full tie so this one this one comes out the end of the month hopefully or beginning of um august Yep. God, that's cool, man. Well, Matthew, yep. congratulations on on all your success with these collaborations with your with your custom work, which is always so beautiful to look at. But how cool is it that you have this mailbox money? Uh, not to bring up money, but I mean, like that's that's what Bob Terzula called it. You know, when you definitely when you license it, these, it this, helps. Yeah, it how helps. cool is that? And then people like me and most of the people listening here can get their hands on cool stuff that they've seen you design so it's uh, everybody wins matt matthew thank you so much for coming on the show i appreciate it man thank you always thanks thanks for having me man my pleasure do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations m390 204p and 20cv but bristle at 8cr 13mov and aus-8 you are a knife junkie probably worse that uh xl thug wow that looks so cool and uh man he's showing off those knives at the very end of the show man ooh, those got me excited i am i'm ready to go on that on that big thug i love that americanized tanto uh tanto sorry all right well that's it for the knife junkie podcast please join us on wednesday for the midweek supplemental and then of course thursday night for thursday night knives 10 p.m eastern standard time live right here on youtube facebook and twitch And uh, also be sure to download the podcast so you can listen to it uh, uh, on your commute. It will it will calm you down and make the traffic better for Jim working his magic behind the switcher. I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com call our 24 7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast